Well, well, hello, doctor. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And I think you want me on video, right? Yes, we do, please. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. So we're going to try and get you on video. Whilst you're trying to source that out, let me quickly ask you. I hope this doesn't confuse everything. Um, so we're talking about mass testing. And this morning we spoke to the information minister and he mentioned that we have some 40,000 or maybe a little more uh, test kits in the country. We've conducted a number of tests. We're awaiting results of about 15,000 of them. However, our concern was with the issue of getting more people tested. And he mentioned that there's um, another test that's ongoing, which is the sputum culture, if I got that right. And so I wanted to understand how different this is from the test and how this can also give us the results that we require. And if that's the case, in the place where we don't have enough test kits, would this be a good way to conduct the mass test? Um, I, okay, I need to get the terminology right so okay. far. Well, there are only two, mm -hmm. two main tests. Okay. There's the PCR test, which has been performed at Noguchi Memorial Institute, and then the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research. And I believe the public health okay. laboratory in Kumasi, in, in Kolebo Teaching Hospital. Okay. Then, so those are the PCR tests. It's we're we're still waiting for your video, by the way. Sorry to cut you. We're still waiting for your video so we can yeah. see you on TV. Yes. Um, I was hoping you could do that whilst we talk to you. Yeah. Yes. And if we don't, we may have to call me back so that I can connect it. I'm not sure what has happened with that. But, okay. Um, okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly, whether you should answer the question. Producer, should we call her back? Yeah, we'll call her back. Okay, we'll call you back. We'll call you back shortly. We'll call you back shortly. Okay. All right. So that's oh, Dr. Actually, Betha Ayi. Last week... Uh, she made a lot of revelations and it was scary, but at the same time, it opened our eyes to the situation on the ground and what we could do. She's here now, so we're going to go straight to her. We can see you. We can see you now. Thank you so much for joining us. You are talking about the types of tests that can be conducted. Right. So there, there's the PCR test. Okay. And then there's also the rapid antibody test. Now, the antibody test... It almost acts like the HIV test, which we do now called the ELISA, meaning you're looking for antibodies. So the PCR is really your gold standard. What it does is that it picks up the virus itself and it, it multiplies it. So it's called the polymerase chain reaction. You actually have to get the RNA of the virus that entered the cell. Mm. So it can become positive as soon as maybe even a day or two after somebody gets infected. Okay. And then it peaks for a while and it decreases. That is what is being used to test if somebody can leave the hospital. Like it's the test that we do daily for three days to determine if it's okay for somebody to be discharged from the hospital. Mm. That is the test that I was telling you last week that even though we give a standard of 14 day period, yeah. it can stay positive for up to 37 days because yes. people are still shedding the virus. So I try to distinguish between a clinical cure meaning you feel better, yeah. and a microbiologic cure using the PCR test. The antibody test is different in that it almost overlaps with the PCR, meaning while the viral load is, is, is becoming less, the antibodies are now starting to form. And so in about maybe from zero to about eight days of illness, it can give you a falsely negative test mm -hmm. because the body's spleen and immune system haven't had time to produce enough antibodies. Mm. You're really picking what we call IgG, IgM. These are the things that the body produces in response to an infection. Okay. So it overlaps. So similarly with HIV, the first week of an HIV illness, if you do the PCR test, it'll be positive. Mm -hmm. If you do the ELISA or antibody test, it will be negative. Okay. So the advantage of this antibody test is that Although it can give you a false negative, it stays the IgG and antibody stays long, stays positive for a long time. Mm. So that in a year from now, if we wanted to do a, a rough estimate of so the whole of Ghana, who actually got coronavirus that we didn't even know because they were asymptomatic, mm -hmm. this test will help us pick all those people up while their PCR will be negative. Even the PCR of those who were very ill will be negative because we assume that in a year from now, they would have stop shedding virus completely 
Yeah. So the advantage of the antibody test is that because it's fast and can be done between 15 to 45 minutes, you are able to test a large group of people. Let's say somebody tested positive in uh, Bekwai, and you mm -hmm. want to test all the people in Bekwai. Okay. It gives you a quick way of getting all that information within one day. Mm. While if you took it to a PCR lab, although it's the gold standard, it will take a while. They may be backed up because it takes maybe six hours to be able to finish running that test. Okay. The good thing is that it looks like Ghana's strategy going forward will not just be do, to do the antibody and leave it at that. It's going to be confirmed with the PCR so that if you're in that window where the antibody test is negative, mm -hmm. the PCR will be able to confirm for sure that, yes, you don't have the disease. If the antibody test is positive, the PCR test will tell us whether you got it in January and you recovered and that's why you have the positive antibody or you oh. are actively ill at the time. It's probably best to demonstrate with a graph. Maybe next time I'll probably. draw some graphs. But maybe, maybe I'll send you a graph so okay. that you can show it to Yes. Okay. All right. Understood. Now, there are people who were in mandatory quarantine, um, you know, that tested negative the first time. They waited, I think, about right. a week or two and tested them again. And this time around, they tested uh, positive. And so those people are staying behind in, in isolation. However, can you hear me? Yes. I okay. lost connection for a bit. Yes. So I'm talking about the people who were in mandatory quarantine. There were some who tested negative at the beginning and then tested positive after 14 days. There's another group that also tested negative in the beginning and have tested negative again. And they've been allowed to go home. How many tests do you need to conduct? Let's just say that I've done the first and second and I've tested negative. Is that enough to rule out any possibility of me catching the virus at the moment? Or will there be another test moving forward um, for these people who have gone home? Maybe do they have to come back after 14 we, uh, days again? Do you get what I mean? Well, I think I, I understand. Yeah. I think it depends on the time. Okay, once somebody is positive, they remain positive for that period if it's 10 days or so. Mm -hmm. The people who tested negative, maybe it was the beginning of their illness. They probably even caught it in the plane getting here because those planes landed on 21st, March 20th and 21st. So it's possible, I mean, I'm just hypothesizing that they caught it rather early. Yeah. And so that maybe that's why their first test um, we're positive. But in the clinic setting or hospital setting, we don't just do like one test a week ago and then the next test. We wait for you to see that you, you are recovering. Mm -hmm. And then the test should be done three days in a row. Okay. One, two, three. So you should have three consecutively negative tests. Some three. facilities okay. that don't have yes, three. Some, but it's not, some facilities who want to be extra careful um, do three, perform three tests. Some go with two tests. Either way, so long as it's not one test, it is good. Okay. And this is important because you are releasing people back into um, a healthy population and you want to make sure that they're not um, surreptitiously going to spread infection to other people with the thoughts that they've recovered. So I think these are um, really um, important extra steps that um, the government is taking if okay. indeed that is how they're being done. All right. Yesterday, the president addressed us, and he said that we're waiting the results of some 15,000 samples that were being tested, and that will determine what uh, decision he makes, whether to, of course, extend the lockdown or not. My question is, do we necessarily have to wait for these 15,000 uh, 15, test results to come out before we know whether to extend the lockdown or not? Um... Not really, because um, I don't, they, they may be connected to some extent, but not to the full extent of it. They're not connected in this way. Um, two weeks ago, um, March 27th, he gave a speech. A mm -hmm. decision was made that yeah. on the 29th, we're going on a 14-day lockdown. It, had, it didn't have much to do with those um, 15,000 people. They, yeah. those are, they are important. Yeah. But we were talking about the country as a whole, that for all the people who are not related to those 19,000 people, if you have anybody who is carrying disease, mm -hmm. you want to give them 14 days to show up with symptoms. And if somebody's not showing up with symptoms, you want them to stay at home so they don't transmit the disease. Yeah. So you actually see the effect of your stay at home 
at about day 12 to 14, after you ask people to stay at home, you would, you would start seeing the decrease. But then you don't let go at that time. You continue with your um, stay at home for another four weeks. And if you've studied most of the countries that have done the stay at home strategies, that is what they, they have done, where you, you stick on with this for about six weeks before you see the flattening of that epi epidemiological curve. Okay. So it's important that we do that. Of course, I think what he's saying is that he's aware of this, but if those 15,000 tests come and they inform him as to the areas in which these people live and the degree, maybe he will alter it in terms of, you know, more restriction, more people staying at home. It could go beyond six weeks. But I think th those are the, the, the factors he's looking at because when people stay at home, I know it's a necessary evil, but of course it's very, very inconvenient. But I was just delighted listening to the speech because um, to me, I call it a good marriage of science and politics mm. leading to a very, very beautiful outcome because clearly um, the president and his team are not making off the cuff decisions. They are using science to make very sound decisions. And I'm really, really proud to call myself a Ghanaian at this point in history, um, not only in terms of the mandatory lockdown, the way the enforcement is being done nicely, and the compassion that goes with it. Providing food for hungry, absorbing water bills. I mean, it's like, you know, they say a friend in need is a friend indeed. Yeah. I mean, when you have a government who responds when there's a crisis, then you have a really good government. Definitely. Dr. Bertha, thank you so much for speaking to us. Today we can't speak at length, unfortunately, but we hope to do Probably. some more tomorrow. So thank you so much for speaking to us. You're welcome. All right. And she's a special disease, um, well, a disease specialist, pardon me, Dr. Bertha Ayi.